Hi there. Welcome to the lecture on diptera of medical and veterinary importance. Uh, here we're going to talk about uh, a couple of different classes of diptera. Uh, in the order diptera, there are about 120,000 different species, and out of those, 27 of the families are considered veterinary or medically important. In the diptera, when we classify flies, of course, we have the suborders nematocera and brachycera. Nematocera include your mosquitoes, drain flies we talked about in the sandfly lecture, black flies, midges. In Brachyceras, we have the um, Tabanomorphidae, so the Tabanidae, those horse and deer flies, those really big ones, uh, soldier flies. Then we move on to some, this in the suborder Brachycera, we have an infraorder, and these are kind of your, uh, what are called the muscomorphas or muscids. And uh, we have the humpback fly, hover flies, fruit flies, house flies, tetsi fly, which is an important one, blue bottle fly associated with cadavers, flesh flies, bot flies, cadaver flies, and lice or louse flies, known as keds. So when we look at the suborder nematocera, we're going to spend a little time talking about black flies or the sim simudes. And there's over 2,000 different species of these flies. We're obviously not going to look at all of them. But many of these are cryptic relationships. So we have many cryptic species. Um, and because of these cryptic species, it's really difficult to identify. So they do something called chromosomal banding or polyteen chromosomal banding. And they take the chromosomes. Uh, flies have very big, giant chromosomes. That's what you're seeing up here, A, B, and C. These are your chromosomes. And they will stain the chromosomes with specific types of dyes. And after staining the chromosomes, they look at these banding patterns, right? And these banding patterns will be common or the same between different species. And these banding patterns here are formed by where on the chromosome heterochromatin is formed. Remember, you have euchromatin and heterochromatin. And with heterochromatin, it's very condensely and tightly packed. It's non-transcriptional, and euchromatin is functional. So where these different banding patterns occur on the actual chromosomes themselves is unique for every species. So this chromosomal banding is used to differentiate between two cryptic species. The uh, simulidase are the first ones we're going to look at. And these are those nasty little black flies. These guys are really tiny. They're a major nuisance. Um, they do bite humans but they're not human exclusive. Human exclusivity uh, or, uh, uh, is known as mammalophily, and they do not express this. Uh, they're mainly, mainly just a nuisance. They just get everywhere, and they're all over all the time. There are a few that can uh, cause some diseases. One is called uh, black fly fever. Uh, sorry for the misspelling there. Uh, in black fly fever, people have a really strong immune reaction to it. It's seen in the northeastern United States and Canada. That's where we have high populations of these black flies. They, get it, they have an um, allergic reaction to saliva from the black fly. Remember, these guys are biting. So when they bite, saliva is introduced into the capillary region. And the skin uh, area surrounding it gets very red. That's what you can see up here. Right? We have these big red blotches. And that's called black fly fever. In the United States, black flies are not known to transmit any disease. We just know that they can cause this kind of immune type reaction. Um, black fly transmission of uh, Oncocerca volvulus, um, also known as river blindness or Oncocerciasis, um, this is actually transmitted by the black fly, just not in the United States. So here we have Mexico down into South America, Brazil, and the mosquito belt of the African continent. So these are countries that contain or um, harbor onco, uh, onchocerciasis. Uh, it is the second, causing, uh, second leading cause of blindness around the world. It's a uh, filarial worm, and this filarial worm gets up into the eye. It's mostly found in the mountainous regions of Central and South America, as well as equatorial Africa, which we refer to as the mosquito belt. So here we have um, onchocerciasis in humans, and we are the definitive host. Here is the uh, filarial worm here in the eye. You can see right there. And here is just some filarial worms all wound up. 
This is what the blindness looks like, the eyes uh, kind of like a cataracts, real severe cataracts. Uh, the larvae are transmitted when the, the black fly is feeding on a human. And um, the, because of the different development stages, transmission will only occur after a third blood meal. So these black flies live for a couple of days and they will blood feed multiple times. But it isn't until the third blood meal, after the third blood meal actually, that onchocerciasis uh, can be transmitted. Uh, these flies have to be about 10 to 12 days old before they can transmit this particular uh, helminth. In uh, humans, the third stage larvae will mort, molt excuse me, uh, during the first week. After the first week, juveniles are going to emerge and they take anywhere from 12 to 18 months to fully develop into uh, adults. Reproduction will only occur after they have matured into full adults. The adult worms, ooh, excuse me, will form these nodules, right? So they get these nodules um, all over their backs and uh, all over their legs. And the nodules are in deep tissue. There is no immune response to these nodules, but inside of the nodules is where mating takes place. And so re sexual reproduction will occur in these nodules. The microfilaria from the reproductive structures will migrate up into the eye and they get into the visceral humor of the eye and um, they'll remain there for years feeding off of the eye and of course they're just their physical obstruction will end up causing blindness. Uh, here we have some more nodules, right? So here's another nodule here. Uh, here are a bunch of worms. Look at all of these microfilaria inside of a nodule. So this is what inside of that looks like. Um, microfilaria in the, that are found in the skin cause very intense itching. Uh, it's um, uh, uh, moving around and this really intense itching can oftentimes cause secondary bacterial infections including um, uh, Wolbachia bacteria. So secondary bacterial infections, staph infections, uh, pseudomonal folliculitis, those sorts of things. In the bloodstream and moving around in the body, the patient will develop headaches, fever, lesions, uh, depigmentation is common um, in the African-American uh, uh, population. We can see microfilaria in the eye. If they'll start releasing, they do. They are filarial worms and they have a symbiotic relationship with those Wolbachia bacteria. So when the Wolbachia get released, this can cause um, uh, really strong immune responses and the very strong immune responses and physical damage by the filarial worm will eventually lead to uh, blindness. And blindness can occur for a multitude of different reasons. Here are the black fly stages and the life cycle of onchocerciasis. Uh, here we have our human host and the black fly takes the blood meal. The microfilaria will penetrate into the fly's midgut and they're gonna migrate into the thoracic muscles. Here they are a stage one larvae. Eventually they'll develop into a stage three larvae and migrate back to the salivary glands to the proboscis where this black fly will then infect a new human. When the human gets infected, it first enters, right, this stage three larva will develop and enter into subcutaneous tissue just under the skin. This evokes strong immune responses. So you see those reddish type lesions and such. Uh, eventually the adults are going to um, produce that nodule and they'll stay in that nodule for a while and eventually produced microfilaria. The microfilaria are then going to be taken up by the black fly and the life cycle starts all over again. Now, ivermectin is an anti-helminthic drug. It's used mostly in livestock, but it can be used in humans. It can be given every six months for as long as uh, the worms or signs are present. The problem with ivermectin is it only kills larvae. We do not have a way to kill the adult worms. Doxycycline is an antibiotic that is usually given in conjunction with the ivermectin in order to kill any uh, Wolbachia bacteria that may be released by the dying, um, uh, by the dying uh, worms. Other diseases that are caused by uh, or transmitted by black flies is uh, mancillosis, and that is also another filarial worm. 
Um, it's found mostly in South America. It is asymptomatic. Uh, it is the mechanical vector of a disease known as, uh, or I'm sorry, black flies can also transmit uh, tularemia mechanically uh, and also hepatitis B. Uh, black flies of veterinary importance. Uh, these guys are a nuisance. They're a big nuisance. So loss of productivity, um, aggravation, the animals are aggravated, um, and which in turn re stresses them out. They reduce production of milk. They uh, can't eat as well, and they uh, can get sick from other diseases. Uh, bovine onchocercosis, so the same disease that we just looked at in humans can occur in uh, cattle. Uh, leukocytosinosis, this occurs in poultry. Uh, it's another protozoan, that's what we're looking at right here, this protozoan right here, that is the leukocytosinosis. Uh, it's transmitted uh, mostly through poultry. Um, it's fatal in poultry mainly because they just get really severe infections because of how they are growing together. Uh, and there are massive losses in the United States when poultry are raised outside. So we see all of that um, you see all of the signs in that for free range chicken and all of that kind of stuff. Most farms do not allow chickens to run around free range because they get exposed to these black flies and they get this leukocytosinosis. So what these farmers do is they have gigantic barns, great big giant barns with these big ventilation systems in them and the chickens all roam around free inside the barn. Uh, vesticular stem, uh, stomatitis virus and uh, simulotoxicosis. Uh, these are, uh, uh, simulotoxicosis is just a really incredibly al severe allergic reaction to the saliva of black, uh, black flies. There is some toxicity in it. And if a, li a animal is attacked by a huge number of black flies, there's just this crazy population and they're totally swarmed by them. Kind of like you see with this moose here in the water. These are all black flies surrounding its head. So there's a lot of flies attacking that particular animal. Um, the, the toxicity from these black flies can build up in the bloodstream of the animal and eventually lead to death. Black flies do need to be controlled. Um, they can apply different repellents. A lot of times cattle go through what's called a dip um, they'll um, run the cattle through a shower and the shower contains uh, a fly repellent. Uh, they're also uh, smudged so flies don't like smoke and they'll uh, keep small fires going in areas around their around farms and livestock areas just to keep the uh, uh, keep the flies away and they're the fires are kept at a smoking level they're not great big giant fires. For livestock and uh, horses, animals that are out in the pasture a lot, if you don't have a, if they don't have a, some kind of fly trap, what they call it a, a fly mask type contraption, then a lot of times petroleum jelly works really well. These black flies, they're really tiny and they need very thin, soft skin. So they tend to concentrate around the nose, eyes, and ears. And applying petroleum jelly to those areas traps the flies and they get stuck in that petroleum jelly and they can't penetrate it in order to um, in order to bite the livestock. Back in the 70s the World Health Organization carried out a huge program to try to get rid of black flies. It was called the Onchocerciasis Control Program and it targeted adult flies. They were trying to destroy these adult flies so they could just interrupt that transmission cycle and end it right then and there. Uh, the problem is it took about 15 years of maintenance because of how long these worms live in humans. Remember, these worms live for 20, 30 years in a human. So it took a really long period of time to, um, to, to get rid of these black flies. But by the time they were done, 90% of the area was treated and black fly free. So that's a pretty big deal. But think about it. They started in the mid-1970s and it just didn't end until 1995. Uh, Ceratopogonidae, the biting midges. These are sometimes referred to as noceums and uh, uh, punkies. Uh, females are blood feeding, males are not, and they uh, require the blood meal for development of their eggs. Uh, the culicidoids are the most important of the midge uh, blood feeders. They're primarily a nuisance, and they lay eggs and develop, the larvae develop in um, 
moist semi-aquatic marshy type areas, but they can transmit a lot of different viruses, uh, protozoans, and some nematodes. You can see how small they are. They're really quite tiny, but it, they can be in large populations. So Oropuche fever is a virus. It's caused by a bunya virus uh, and was first discovered in the 50s. It is non-fatal, fatal, but it does cause febrile illness. So infants are the ones that get sick. They are sensitive to light. That's what photophobia is. And they have a lot of muscle and joint pain. It takes about anywhere between five and eight days for this disease to show up, and it lasts for about a week. Uh, it can kind of come and go for about two weeks, but uh, it lasts really almost a, almost a week. The primary vector for Oropuchi fever is the Culicidoys peri, uh, periensis. There are a few other viruses transmitted by midges that include the Rift Valley fever, the Dugby virus, Shuni virus, and Crimean Congo virus. These are all uh, mostly Bunya viruses. Midges are known to transmit three different worm species or Helminthic species. They are the Mancinellas and uh, the Azardi, the Perstans, and the Streptocerca. In Mancinelli Azardi, this is found in the Americas, uh, people are asymptomatic, asymptomatic and worms will stay in the skin-like tissue, in the dermal tissue. The Perstans are found in Sub-Saharan Africa, and the adult worms are found in body cavities. Microfilaria will be found in the bloodstream. Um, they can cause a lot of bulging and inflammation in the eye, and so the eye will actually start to like bulge out. Uh, the Streptocerca are found in West and Central African rainforests. They are not known to cause disease in humans. Now, there are midges of some veterinary importance. Uh, they can actually transmit more than 35 different viruses to domestic animals. But the three uh, diseases we're going to look at real quick are blue tongue disease, African horse sickness, and what's known as EHD, or epizootic hemorrhagic disease. Blue tongue disease affects mostly sheep. And it is found worldwide. It is quite prolific. There's, there was recently an outbreak in Europe of blue tongue disease. Uh, the only places we don't see it is in Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii. And the distributions of the epicystems are different. Uh, so it all has to do with where the vector species occurs. So different um, viruses, different versions or sub versions of the virus are going to occur in different species of midges and where they occur depends on where the midges actually live. So North America, South America, Africa, etc. So here we have blue tongue and sheep. Uh, most animals are uh, asymptomatic and if they do have symptoms, they might be very mild or they might be very severe. They can even be fatal. What you're looking at in this top left here, that is a, um, that is an, a, a dead sheep. Uh, they get this, these ulcers and eventually the tongue will turn blue. You can see here on this sheep, uh, the tongue has turned this kind of bluish color from uh, loss of oxygenation. And so that's why it's referred to as blue tongue disease. They also get this ring around their hoof. That's what they're showing you right here. Uh, it's called the corona band um, and it occurs around the hoof and it has like this blackish bluish color. They'll get lesions on the hoof. They can't breathe. Um, death will eventually occur because of uh, lung con congestion, filling up with fluids, and internal hemorrhaging. The virus is found primarily in newborns. So calves will be very underweight. They'll have abnormalities, um, and the virus is found in infected bull semen. Some females will have stillbirths um, or they will abort. There are some vaccines available, but not all serotypes of this virus are actually going to be covered by it. So um, there are some areas where multiple serotypes may be present, which means the efficacy or efficiency of the vaccine has declined. There are restrictions on the import of livestock and semen into the U.S. because of the spread and the, um, the virulence of blue tongue disease. We already have it somewhat here in the United States, not as bad as other areas, but it is estimated to cost in cattle 
um, several millions do millions of dollars every year because of loss in foreign markets. So we can, we're not importing or exporting. We're very um, strict with the, the cattle industry. And so they lose a lot of money because if blue tongue is present here, they can't export the meat to parts of Europe. EHD or epizootic hemorrhagic disease is very similar to blue tongue, but it only occurs in deer. Well, not just in deer, but in wild ruminants. Uh, it is an orbivirus as well, and it is related to the blue tongue virus. Uh, there are 10 different species of it, or what we call serotypes in virology. Uh, here in North America, there are two that are of concern, the Jersey strain and the Alberta strain. Uh, they have the same signs and symptoms as blue tongue. It's sometimes referred to as black tongue. Hunters can, may find if there's an outbreak, they'll find deer dead and the tongue will be black and swollen. The vector are um, the Culicides uh, genus. Uh, so they're the only midges that are known to transmit it. There are vectors in other parts of the world that are not known. They're believed to be midges, but the species have not yet been identified. So. Um, it's, being, it's spread in other areas, but they're not sure exactly which, which species or subspecies even are transmitting it. The characteristics you can see here, these are some deer that are dying of this particular disease. Um, they have a very rapid onset of fever, lose their appetite, their heads, heads will hang down, and eventually um, the tongues will swell up and they won't be able to breathe. So they get a swelling in their head and hooves. Uh, it primarily affects white-tailed deer. Midges really surround these guys and uh, go after them. African horse sickness is another virus spread by midges, and it's by, from the family Rio uh, Viridae. It's also known as La Pesta Equine, uh, Pesta Equina, and Equine Plague. We see it in the Arabian Peninsula and parts of Africa, and there are nine different serotypes of this virus that are known. You can see in red here, where it is endemic. There is no, we are not getting rid of it in these areas. We've had some outbreaks up here in uh, the uh, uh, Middle East, up in this area, over into India and Pakistan. Uh, there's, uh, it's quite endemic. It's been around for a while. It is transmitted again by the Culicides genus. Um, uh, there are a few other uh, uh, Culicides species suspected to be part of it. Um, but that has not been confirmed. There are four different uh, forms of African horse sickness. Paracute, subacute, acute, and horse sickness fever. Paracute affects the pulmonary system, so uh, breathing, airways. Subacute will affect the cardiac system, and acute is a mixture of the two. Eventually, it will all boil down to the fourth form, which is horse sickness fever. So the, this is very similar to the black tongue in deer. There's a very rapid onset of symptoms. One thing that horses will do is they will sweat profusely. They have um, an increased respiratory rate. They'll have frothing in the nostrils. The frothing in the nostrils is just before death. It's uh, quite late in the infection stage. Uh, the horses, however, will die within a few days after contracting it. The protozoan pathogens that are spread by midges include the hemosporidians. There are three genres of them, um, and again, culicides are the genus that are suspected um, to vector it. In the hemosporidians, most of these are going to in, uh, infect birds. You can see just from these red blood cells. These are avian red blood cells because they are nucleated. Uh, the female midges will uh, take up uh, gametocytes, and the gametocytes will uh, mature inside of the midge. Sexual reproduction will take place, and sporozytes will be the result of that. The sporozytes are then entered, are then um, uh, introduced into a mammalian or avian host. Uh, mammals are not as highly affected as often as the birds are. So uh, the hemosporidian that uh, affects uh, here in the United States that can be a problem are the wild and domestic turkeys. Uh, heavy infections can cause uh, 
uh, loss of diet or uh, anemia, loss of weight, and growth ability. So it's uh, reduced productivity. Young birds are at risk, and the most at risk are domestic birds because domestic birds are kept in very tight, close, tight, close quarters. Leukocytozoan is the most dangerous of the hemosporidians. It's known as Bangkok hemorrhagic disease, and it affects chicken for the most part, but poultry in general. It's found over in Thailand and Southeast Asia. And then finally, we have equine onchocerciasis. Uh, this is in the, the filarial uh, nematode, which infects horses. Uh, it is more common here in the United States and Australia and causes equine dermatitis. The microfilaria will get into um, the skin of the horse and start migrating around in the skin. Uh, it causes a really strong histamine response or allergic response, so a lot of inflammation occurs. Uh, and it can, you can see here, it's causing weeping in that of the withers here. Uh, this disease is uh, a problem here in the United States. Uh, and you can see here this up here, this mangy looking, uh, it is sometimes mistaken for mange, but this mangy looking uh, type infection. Here's more forms of equine dermatitis. Uh, the culicidoi species, they, were, they just really evoke a very strong immune response. So you'll see a lot of inflammation and swelling and that type of thing. This type of um, equine dermatitis caused by these um, culicides, uh, you can see it's always down this ventral line. This is called the ventral midline of horses and cattle and such. So it's always along this uh, ventral midline. It will move down onto the buttocks and the back legs like here, but it's going to be primarily up top here. Sometimes it's referred to as sweet itch, summer itch, summer eczema. Um, in Australia, they call it Queensland itch. It is found worldwide, worldwide, and the reason you see all of it occurring here, you got to be careful because this skin up here will harden. It sometimes gets really hard and crusty. Um, and uh, the, the uh, ventral midline of horses is the most common feeding site for female midges. So that's why you usually see those responses there. So that is it for the diptera of medical and veterinary importance. We are going to move on to some fleas. We're also going to be talking about uh, uh, black flies, the horse and deer flies, and we have um, a whole component on tetsy flies. Uh, so for this week, uh, you'll uh, just be taking a look at this one, and I will see you all in class. Have a great day.